Hey everybody, welcome to the Pre-Accident Podcast. I'm Todd Conklin, your loving host. Hey, today's a big day. It's always a big day on the podcast. Thanks for listening. Hope you're doing well. Well, fall is falling, um, and what a bizarre year it's been, weather-wise. I mean, I think personally, things are great, yeah, no complaints, life's good, grand, everything's happening, busy as can be, and what I think is most encouraging is companies and organizations are getting better and safer and more reliable, and that actually makes all this crap worthwhile. I don't know. It's been fun so far. What are we, uh, 50, 60, almost 70 podcasts into this journey? And uh, I can't believe it's still happening. Thank you for listening. It is so nice of you to spend time with us. So today is an interesting day. I won't talk too much on the front end. I'll talk a little bit more on the back end. But I want to introduce to you uh, today's speaker. His name's Jim Joy. And Jim's got about 30 years in the Australian and global minerals industry. He's a mining guy. And he was involved really early in understanding risk management and what he got into is pretty remarkable. He, he talks about this notion of critical controls. Now, if you listen to Tony Mashari, and if you haven't, you ought to probably go pull that one up. Tony talks about the notion of critical tasks, critical steps. Jim talks the same way, but he talks about the safeguards or the barriers. He calls them controls, the critical controls that exist around the way we manage failure. It's very new thinking. In fact, I would say it's very new family or new view thinking. Assume the failure is going to happen, manage, implement, audit, and assess the controls for that failure. It's a little bit predictive, a little bit linear, but I really like where they're going with these ideas, and you should as well. Give this one a listen. It's well worthwhile. Again, this is at the CME meeting, the Congress of Minerals and Energy in Australia. And Jim and I shared the podium. And so Jim's going to refer, actually, to my presentation in this uh, presentation. You're going to like it. But give this one a listen. There's pretty much not a, a dull second in here. And if you're interested in risk management and controls, risk competency and controls, this is the podcast for you. So without any further ado, this is Dr. Jim Joy. Listen carefully and more at the tail end. Bye. Jim, uh, most recently was a professor um, at, uh, at UQ, where the um, Minerals Industry Safety and Health Center, uh, which he ran uh, for a while. He has uh, decades of experience in the, uh, in the industry. Many of you may have come across uh, him and, for example, his work on, on critical controls, uh, which, in fact, he is currently uh, developing with various stakeholders in the industry as well. Jim has, uh, has uh, formerly uh, left UQ, is now um, working with, uh, with many other parties and stakeholders in industry to improve various aspects of critical, uh, critical controls. Um, Jim, um, are you ready to deliver the, the second plenary talk? Yeah, I'll, I'll hang around here. Does anybody want to do this presentation? Because I'm feeling a little bit nervous about it after our last presentation. I really, I really think that that was probably the, the very, very best welcome to country I have ever heard. Uh, in all the co- Oh, that presentation was good too. Thanks, Todd. That was, that was really good. Look, guys, I've, I've got a presentation that's, that has been done... Um, around the world in the last three months because the industry itself decided to try to make a a step change in some of the ways that we manage risk. Now, I try my darndest when I'm behind a a, a really good uh, keynote speaker to tie things to my presentation from his or her presentation before me. And there were a few things you can tie to it, but you're going to have to extrapolate a bit. I mean, I'm going to show you some statistics, which is uh, performance of the industry, but I'm showing it to you because that's the way we think, right? And I do agree that it's not the right way to think, but we think that way. We got all the CEOs together last August in Brisbane to talk about 15 or 16 fatalities last year, and we wouldn't have got them in the room for any other reason, but we had a body count that people were worried about. You know, that's the culture of the industry, and I'm kind of a, I'm kind of a journey guy. I'm kind of a journey guy. I love I love uh, listening to best practice in the world, but I see my job as sort of saying, you guys move at a certain rate of speed as an industry. And, the, and what you, 
yeah, I was really pleased that a lot of people with the hands they've shown are obviously have a much better mindset than we used to have 20 years ago about why accidents happen. But we're still on a journey here. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about in terms of critical controls is what's seen as the next step on the journey. Not the light at the end of the tunnel, but the next step of the journey. So this presentation has been done in, uh, since the publication, which I'm going to talk about, which, which I'll talk about in more detail, since it's been done, has been done to industry in Johannesburg, Melbourne, Santiago, Washington, and this is the next one. All right, so the whole idea is to get the message out relatively consistently. So that's where my talk's going to going to focus on. Uh, operational risk management, just in case uh, that you have a defin different definition than what I'm using, is site plant level stuff. All right? This is how we do things on the site. We're trying to impact at the site level on how we manage risk. And the critical control terminology I'll talk about because it has now a kind of a formal uh, process approach. So I'm going to try and do quickly, just make sure you see why the industry wanted to do this. So I'm not an expert in this. I got the job to write it up by learning from people in the industry who see it as the way we go forward. So some of your companies have experts that I went and talked to. We had a couple of meetings in London. Uh, we had another meeting in Melbourne. We tried to get everybody to think on the same page and get a process approach to doing this that all the companies agreed to. I interviewed 16 of 22 uh, companies in the world that are members of ICMM. I just finished an ACARP study, which I in, in, uh, interviewed 12 of the coal companies on the East Coast. So it kind of all of this comes from that sort of gathering of information. So this is not a research project from the University of Queensland. This is uh, an attempt to put a small guide together of what the industry thinks it should be doing to move forward on the evolution in risk management. Uh, so I'll tell you really quickly why it was developed. I'll go through the steps, but what I like to do and why I like to do these presentations is be careful with this because it can also sound like the silver bullet, and we don't need another silver bullet. As you guys all know, we're pretty susceptible industry to silver bullets. Wow, we can, if we bought that program, that's going to happen. You know, that is, we're, we're really in that mindset. Work a lot on vehicle interaction and proximity detection systems. Let's get those. They'll solve all our problems. You know, it's that sort of stuff. So I want to caution you a bit, and that's the last section. So moving fairly quickly... The numbers that Todd talked about, those are, those are the, that's the way we kind of measure ourselves. And I like to use this stuff at this point to say, you should be proud that you're doing better than the rest of the people are in the other industries in the country. You should be proud of that. Uh, we are, as an industry, improving better, and we, as an Australian mining industry, are improving better than anybody else in the world. So you should be proud of that as people who contribute hugely to this. But the reality is beyond the sort of injury stuff that we get off the federal system, we talk about fatalities. We do talk about fatalities a lot. Your leaders talk about fatalities a lot. It's still the topic of conversation. You know, I'm sure there are people in your companies that get penalized for fatalities. And so they focus their efforts on fatalities. They used to do it on last time injury frequency rate, but we changed that. Now we make it fatalities. And it's still a hit me in the hip pocket sort of stuff. Uh, we have had much improved performance in this area, but <clears throat> those are the kind of things that go wrong. But the bottom one is that we've had a couple of bad years. And I think uh, last year you'd probably say there was 11, but I think under the regulatory process it counts as nine, which is an interesting conversation in itself when people say, well, there's nine because we're not counting these two. You know, it's just a, it's a, it's a funny conversation to listen to as it's trying to improve risk in the industry. But those are some of the drivers for looking for a way to evolve risk management. But the main one when you talk to the companies is the risk register. Okay, we're creating these documents at our sites and operations that have these list of things that could go wrong. And to listen to the other companies, sometimes there's 2,000 things on the list. You know, there's hundreds of things on the list that can go wrong. And there are lists of controls that match those things. And there are thousands of controls, things that we do to reduce this risk. So we end up with an almost useless, to be quick and dirty, list of paper that gets created and then filed and is almost useless as a management tool. Um, the dimensions of that, the poor quality of the document itself, you know, too many things in it. We're really not talking well enough about controls. So we really have something that we really need to improve on if we're going to really manage these high-consequence events. 
which is where we are in our journey, I think. And I've been doing risk management mining since I came here from Canada in, the, in you know, late 80s. And we've gone through journeys. You know, we did the rack thing in the 90s, you know, the rack form. And we all got excited about our 5 by 5s in the 90s. And some of us are still excited about them, which really scares me. And, and we're, we're now evolving more towards being really, really knowledgeable. We know what we need to do. We, we, you know, we're putting our hands up for the right things in the room. But we're still doing a lot of the stuff we did in the 90s that really hasn't evolved. So this is what critical controls is trying to do. That risk register thing came out of our sort of proactive approach in the 90s. And we've kind of maybe, you know, this varies across your sites, of course. But in some situations, we've hung on to this far too long. And we think it's a management tool, and it's not. That's what you're hearing from the company. So the ICMM is, uh, if, if you don't know the ICMM, the International Council of Mines and Metals based in London, it's a sustainability generally organization. There's 22 member companies. Many of your companies are members, and they have a health and safety committee made up of the chief health and safety people in the global operations. And they say back, and they sat back and they said, we need to produce a user-friendly guide on critical control management focused on health and safety. And those of you who are not totally health and safety, clearly risk management can be applied to whatever you're concerned about, positively or negatively. Uh, but this has a health and safety focus. They commissioned uh, me and a couple other people, you remember, Mike, some of you might remember Mike Byrne from Newmont. He used to be with WMC here in, in Perth. He's retired now. And a guy by the name of Jeff Burgess from the University of Arizona, a health uh, guru. The three of us did this guide. So we, we tried to do the bottom four things for the industry. The way we did it, though, is we went to them and asked them and pulled their information together. So we now have this document, which is not a thick document. This is flight to Adelaide reading material. Maybe not even that far, right? It's a very brief document, and we made sure that for everybody, we put in lots of pictures. So it's not a lot of words. It's a lot of pictures, a lot of illustrations. It's a very practical process guideline, and it's available for free at that website. So you can download it from IC go to ICMM Publications, down the list, find the document. You can download the PDF. Steps. It is a process guideline. So ICMM doesn't usually write process stuff. They tend to write sort of textbooks on on how to deal with uh, native people, about uh, land rights, how to do stuff with uh, environmental risk assessment is a fairly technical textbooky thing. This is definitely a process guideline. So it's designed to be very practical. And the process in it, that's the illustration, that's a PDF cut and paste out of here because when you write things for ICMM, they don't send you the final stuff. I had to cut and paste out of the PDF myself, but that's the image. And it is a circular one because it's supposed to be a continuous improvement kind of model that we decide on what we're going to do, we analyze, we do a lot of stuff we do now in terms of risk assessment, maybe slightly different, but most of this model is about management, and that is that we ensure that the people who work for us, wherever they make decisions that are critical to risk, understand that their decision has to consider this critical control. And this is the thing that's scary to me. Um, there's only one or two or three critical controls for every catastrophe in your business. Okay, now get that right and happy camper. Get that wrong, you could be in real strife. So this is where we need to be careful. And if you can imagine, and some of you in the room I know are executives, sometimes the executives kind of their eyes light up because they go, oh great, I had to manage 2,000 things in the risk register before, now I got three. Yay, I love this, let's do it tomorrow. And you kind of go, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, it's not that easy. It's not that easy. So the process tries to highlight that in the guideline, but I'm going to talk a little bit more than what's in the guideline about that issue. And I'm going to start by sort of talking about finding these events. We can still use our 5 by 5 thing to find events, but what we're looking for is the highest con consequence events. The guide will say, don't even think about the likelihood. If you've got the hazard, if you've got the energy source that can cause a multiple fatality, and you define in your company that multiple fatality is a level of materiality that you're concerned about, that could be equivalent of an environment or a financial loss, too. You find that event. Okay, you find that event. And you'll have Angle Goldashani has, I think, uh, 21. So, a couple guys from Angle. 21 here. I think BHP has a similar number. Everybody has around 20 material unwanted events as a mining company. Not that many at a, at a site individually, but as a mining company where you have multiple commodities and underground and surface, etc. So, finding that event... 
uh, we do that fairly traditionally. We may have a little quality issue there, but we do it traditionally now. We find those kinds of events. Once you find them, though, the thing we don't do generally consistently across the industry is really question our controls. Like, what have we got in place to make sure that event doesn't happen to prevent it? Or should it begin to occur to mitigate it? And that's where this is um, a, lot, a, a lot of work, a fair amount of work to do. Again, in talking to mining companies, you know, uh, uh, Angle Gold Shanty, for example, has done a lot of what we call bow ties. I'll show you in a second. You all know what bow ties are now. Um, a, a lot of analysis goes into these simple answers of three controls. So quickly, bow ties are an analytical tool. And I'm not going to tell you how to do one. You guys know how to do this now. It's been around the industry for years. There are ways of looking at controls. It's a method. Um, finding the event you want to analyze. This is a barracks list. This is what they showed in Washington in mid-June. There are a list of sort of fatal risks that they talked about. And the terminology is a bit inconsistent here. But they came up with these from the uh, material unwanted events from that list. So they create... We're concerned about aviation. Aviation is not an unwanted event, right? But there's a title on almost all your MUE lists, I'm sure, which is aviation, especially if you've got FIFO. There's aviation is in there. There's something that you're concerned about within aviation that you analyze. So there's a step in the guide to try and help you move from areas of concern to defined unwanted events. Once you get those events and you start doing your bow tie, here's a big change. This is a big change to how you do bow tie, I'm sure. This came out of some work that was done with eight of the mining companies, and that is... Anything that prevents or mitigates an unwanted event, we're going to call a control. And you can call it defense or safeguard. There are other names for it. We're going to call it a control. And that control, in order for it to be a critical control or even in your bow tie, a control is an act, an object, or a system. So I always get in some sort of fight, not physical like Todd gets into, but, you know, some sort of verbal stoush. I stop. I run at the physical stuff. But the training is not a control. Supervision is not a control because we can't measure it. We can't validate it. We can't audit it. It's not a specifiable enough for us to manage well, supervision. But supervision is important. And one of your failure modes for an act that you want people to do, which to drive to work in a certain way, say at a certain speed or whatever act you want or behavior you want, is to say, what, what are the confounding factors? Well, maybe the, uh, sorry, the, the eroding factors. And that might be that the person doesn't know how to drive or doesn't realize what the speed limit is or doesn't recognize the conditions, which are all not this guy we don't want to work for us problems. There are issues of providing that context for the person to drive to work that makes sure we get the behavior we want. So what we're trying to do is focus all this intensive study of uh, our understanding of the things that we need to manage well so we've got to define what we're going to focus on well. An object, of course, is like a pressure relief valve at your plant. You know, no human involvement other than the design component. It's designed, installed, maintained. It's, it works by itself when required. A system is a combination of the two. We have a lot of systems. We have a lot of acts. We have a lot more acts that are critical in our industry than the petroleum industry does or the offshore oil industry does. And this is where this comes from. So this is one of my be careful here because we get a lot of acts. But think about those definitions. On the workshop this afternoon, we'll talk about these definitions more. But really understanding what a control is better, making sure that that control is specifiable, measurable, auditable, are the questions you're going to ask before you put it in your bow tie. And we aren't even near critical controls yet. We're just trying to get a good bow tie. If you want to get more into this, uh, a lady at the University of Queensland named Maureen Hassel, uh, Dr. Maureen Hassel, uh, wrote a very good ACAR paper that covers this stuff that was, again, s using the expertise of eight or nine mining companies, many of them the same as yours, to try and synthesize and get better ways of optimizing our important controls. Go to that resource. If you're not on coal, which none of you are, I would imagine, or only a couple of you are, you're going to have to pay for it. But uh, it's not very much money. So what we're trying to do with this critical control thing is once we do a nice bow tie and we've got the right acts and systems and objects, we want to go back in there and find the ones that are absolutely critical. So those are things like the critical control for the bag of sand falling was that we had a demarked area where there was no asset underneath, people or otherwise. Right? So our critical, if that was a critical control for moving sand onto the vessel, then it was successful. 
That's what we want the critical control to do. That's really important. We don't do the work if we can't do that. If we can't get people out of the area, we don't do the work. All right? It's on my SOP for moving the sandbag. Big red bowl. This is what they do at Escondida and, and Chile. Big red bowl thing that says the most important thing you do is to make sure nothing's underneath it, the transportation row to the bag from wherever to the ship. That might be a critical control. In the case example that was given by Todd, that control worked. Correct? Does that make sense to you? So that piece of cheese right there, and we all know the Jim Reason stuff, the, uh, whoop, let me get it. That might be the critical control. So it's a little bit of a link between his presentation and mine. Did you get that? Okay, let's do 1 to 19 again. No, oh, never mind. So we got a critical control. In the guideline, you will find that there are exercises. You can see BHP bulletins. It's a little blurry. I'm sure that's cut right out of the guide. Um, there are nice little decision trees to walk you through this finding your critical control. It looks easier than it is. But that's the challenge. Now, at this point, let me throw in this because this is my bugaboo. Every one of your companies likes this. I've interviewed... 16 of 22 ICM companies, three or four are doing it. The rest say, we're going to do it. And we got companies talking to me like they don't even do risk assessment in the United States. Say, we don't do risk assessment yet, but we're going to do critical controls. And I'm going, whoa, wait a minute. On the coal industry, I talked to 12 companies. 11 of them said, well, three or four are saying they're doing it. The rest are saying they're going to do it, except for one who says we're not sure. And that was one guy at a one-mine operation. So this is a wave of change, which I have never seen in 30 years in the minerals industry. It's a wave of change that's huge. It's going to take time. Things like this will evolve. And the other bit I wanted to harp at you at is, by the way, every company is doing exactly the same thing. Everybody, every company is doing the same bow ties, doing the same analysis, having the same discussions, and there's some level of wastage in there somewhere that we're not cooperating through mechanisms like the chamber and other mechanism to try and be more efficient at this. Once we get our critical control, let's say it is the clearing the area so that when the bag goes over, there's nobody underneath it, then once we've got that, we ask questions about it. You know, what's the objective of why do we clear that area? What's, let's make sure we understand exactly what we're trying to do. Let's understand what the performance requirements are. There may be performance requirements with some of your, your objects, which are technical. You know, this pressure relief valve must relief at, at X pressure. But if it's a behavior of things, there might be performance requirements, like I mentioned before, like the person understands what they need to do. They, they understand how to drive the truck. They are aware at this moment in time on the haul road that the speed limit is X. You know, they are aware of what to do at this intersection. And they are aware uh, because of the sign, maybe, or because of the supervisor's knowledge. But, and they are also, we also confirm that they do what they're going to do. So there's a series of questions that we, we try to derive that will make us comfortable that that control will do what we need it to do. It's much more intense uh, questions about control than I've ever experienced. And again, it's taken out of the oil industry where the, a lot of those questions are about objects. And this one's, we got a lot more acts. So this is going to be a little tricky for us. And finally, once we get that, we can actually send a target. Now, we, now we're starting to talk, I really like this, now we're starting to talk reliability of our control. We've never done that before. You know, we've never talked about, as an industry, the reliability, because reliability is an objective discussion. It may require uh, quantitative data. We haven't got it, and it's getting us to think more maturely like some of the other industries that, that are around, such as the chemical industry, nuclear industry, etc., Without taking this too far, just quickly, the difference in color in gray and orange is that the guy does say that there's so much work in getting to the right critical controls. It's probably not a site-level analysis. It's probably a business unit-level analysis. And then there's implementation at the site. But that's up to your company. The, the, if you do it at the business unit, then the site really looks in the bottom at, uh, corner at the site-specific thing about whether that's hazardous related to them, the controls related to them. They agree with the verification. You're defining reporting requirements, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Really you're, really, you're creating a, a management information network, which to me looks a little cumbersome, but it, some of the companies have got it to work. And that is, if, if we're worried about vehicle collisions, and most of your surface mine people would have one of your MUEs as something to do with vehicle collisions, I'm sure. You might have the couple of critical controls, one related to some sort of behavior you define or an act, and one related to some sort of a system or object. You would verify those things. You would define how to verify them. And if you had uh, 
verification that was maintenance of the brakes on the truck. If he said the brakes on the truck were a critical control, you wouldn't check it every time it was maintained. Verification is about sampling, right, about identifying something where every once in a while you check this, and it's done at a point where it's random, and you're gathering a bit of data, and somebody has the job of gathering that bit of data. That's the verification activities. And as you can see, there's five examples, verification processes for two controls. Remember, if you only got two or three controls for the truck collision, so this isn't a huge amount of work, but getting it right as a management system may be a challenge. That verification information gets reported to somebody who is the actual owner of that control. That owner might be at the site or in the business, and there is an owner of the event. They are not us in a sense of health and safety people. They are line management. And so the accountability is within the line management. And again, this is a good transition that we're making as an organization, but more and more towards you know, really getting the caring part of the line management thing as the, as the value structure of what we're trying to do. You've got to get that integrated into the business. So that's an image, and it's in the document too. So this is most of the work that's maybe a little bit different from what you've been doing in the past. It's really assigning accountability, reporting systems, etc. cetera. Um, and the last bit is learning from what goes wrong. We learn from that event with the sandbag dropping about the criticality of that control. It worked. Positive information. That should go across. Everybody that handles those kinds of bags becomes aware that an event did not occur because this critical control worked as required. But if, for example, there was a ute parked, and that ute is a, Todd, a ute is a pickup truck, right? I had, it took me a while to get that. Uh, and it, yeah, never mind. But the, if the ute was parked in there and the ute got smashed by the sandbag and flattened, you know, you're going, yay, we didn't have a fatality, but hey, we lost a ute. So there's something we need to adjust in our critical controls because we don't, not only don't want people in there, we don't want utes, we don't want anything in there. So you've, you've got some feedback to change that critical control. So that's why it's a loop because we're reviewing it constantly, whether it's the right control, whether we got it, we're checking it the right way, etc. This is a picture of the AGA dashboard. Uh, AGA puts all this information together, and there's a champion of this in AGA in Johannesburg that pulls it all together. And if you can see the tabs across the top, if you can read them, it doesn't matter. They're, they're mine sites and, and production sites. There's regions in some of those tabs. But all of that information comes together. So you have the colloquial bubble diagram that goes to the board or the senior executive team, which really says this is where we're at related to the bars, the reliability the verification reliability of that critical control for that event in this region, in our company, at that mine. Now, I don't think any of us are really good at doing that yet. We still maybe have people going out with nets and getting rich registers and trying to get information together, but this is really not about our image of probability and consequence of an unwanted event. This is our image of how good our controls are for unwanted events. And I would say to you, challenge your mind. If you think risk is likelihood times consequence, you need to evolve that. Risk is a degree to which your controls are not working. The negative side of risk. Right? And so the control mindset is one of the challenges of this sort of program. Last, just quickly, some of the suggestions. From Rio Tinto, a diagram. And the size of the two squares is important. The risk stuff we do now, they understand the risks and stuff. We do a lot of that. We probably overdo it in some cases. We'll talk about it in the workshop if you come along. The right side, though, where we actually embed our controls, we measure, we verify, we report, we really focus on critical controls, is uh, the verification process is the new part. And I know when I talk to some of the global companies who say they're into this, that they're doing this, yeah, 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 but, boy, when you go and talk to the sites, it's not what the head office thinks it is in a lot of cases. We're still probably building the red side, especially in some companies that are really intensely on the left in risk assessment. You know, we got the list of events. We've done the bow ties. Yes, we know the controls, but they're not managing them, you know, because that's a different thing than they've done in the past to have formal management. Okay, the, the warnings, this does not replace your risk management program at the mine. It, it's an evolution of what you're doing. It's not a radical change. It's an evolution uh, I don't know if you've seen this before, but generally speaking, at your sites, you tend to do these four things. You know, you look across the site for big things, you try to manage change risks, you try to have good work practices or SOPs, and you try to make sure people stop and think. Information that comes out of this analysis, you might say, comes from the full site look, called critical control information. However, that's static. You do it once every three to five years, so you've got to watch out for change. Sometimes some new controls are necessary. That has to be integrated so that 
it gets to the decision point so people know the critical few that need to know it. That might be a mining engineering design, mining engineer designing a haul road and putting it in segregation, or it might be somebody who's about to change a light bulb and falling it's important and whatever you, you think is a critical control to that. So it has to be integrated to be successful. So don't think it's the silver bullet. It's an evolution of one of your existing bullets, if you will. And it's going to be a journey. I'm a journey guy. I like the journey concept. Uh, stole it off of uh, uh, a Billiton guy at, uh, in Richards Bay where they were using the journey, which is a Hudson thing, that uh, Patrick Hudson, that got evolved into other models. I really like that sort of thinking. Uh, if you've got a risk ranking focus now, if you look across your, your workforce and even your managers and you say, whenever we talk about risk, we've got the five by five. How am I doing, Sid? Got a, three minutes, thanks. You've got a risk, risk ranking focus, then you really need to switch that to a control focus because people who hold up the five by five all the time are not thinking about the controls they have and how good they are. And hierarchy control is only part of that question. Again, we'll talk about that in the workshop. Once you start thinking about controls, you do tend to evolve towards thinking, are they good or not? It, that's, that's sort of a natural change. It's a less significant change from risk rank, from the risk ranking to control. And once you get into that, the critical control management thing is near the top. At the top is probably that this is, this is in, integrated into the culture and the way you do business so that it becomes the work process. That's the way we think as a business. We, it's transparent. It's not health and safety. It's the way we do business. So that information is in this. There's a one-page sort of image of the, of the journey. And an ACARP report, a, a research report I'm finishing right now, there's a 12-page tool to actually do the journey analysis if you want to look at that. Part of that came from this interview of companies, which I'll, I've already told you that was a, uh, 12 Australian companies that I talked to. When I talked to them about where they were on the journey, that's where they were of the 12 coal mine companies. And you know, in the east, it's, there's BHP, Rio Tinto, Glencore. There's all the big players are in coal in the east. So we've got four of them. And I would say those that are say they're doing critical control management are still evolving it and the verification and how to report but it's definitely everybody wants to move up that ladder. Probably the, the thing that is holding us back, in my opinion, is how we look at controls with the bow tie and how we think about control effectiveness. So that's what your workshop is at. That's what the workshop this afternoon is about, that control effectiveness thing. Now, Maureen Hassel, who, again, I highly recommend to any of you who are looking for really good expertise in this at, at UQ, very practical lady, worked for Rio Tinto for 20 years, um, when we look at the, when she and I looked at the companies that are actually down the road with this, they're still showing issues. But probably the red circle recognizes where a lot of us are at, which is the quality of our control discussion. So that's what the workshop is about. So in conclusion, this stuff is a major step change. It's not a, it's not a, a new thing. It's an evolution. As a friend of mine, a retired friend of mine said, a mining guy said to me, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater with this. This is an evolution of what we're doing. It's not replacing, it's focusing. That's what we're doing. It's a journey. You should recognize if you want to do this, where you are now in the journey and whether you're ready to embark on this. And I wouldn't recommend it unless you're ready. So in the back of this, there's a, a summary of how to analyze that. In the new ACARP study, there's a really significant tool that you can use. Other stakeholders need to be brought along on the journey, need to be a part of that journey, such as the regulator, such as the union, uh, because it is a significant change in mindset and thinking, a real maturity. And leadership is critical. You know, the leadership example that Todd worked you through, uh, leadership, this will not work without strong leadership. And that is sometimes a big challenge. All considered, though, I think this, in 30 years of working in the mining industry, this makes a huge amount of sense to me for where we are now. And I really wish you, those of you that are on it, all the best of luck in proceeding with it. If you want to hear more about the detail of it, please come to the workshop. That was Jim Joy. What do you think? Ha <laughs> ha. Made you wonder. I bet you I did, too. This whole notion, this idea of critical controls and the documents that are with it, which are all really available. Just look up Jim Joy, uh, critical controls. It pops up all over the web. I think, quite honestly, I'm liking it. I'm liking the way people are thinking. I'm really liking the fact that it moves beyond the worker doing a better job at stopping at stop signs or loading sand or driving a haul truck or, you know, working on an oil platform and says what controls are there if the failure happens. 
Uh, the numbers are big. The numbers are stunning to me. Um, I find that hard to believe. I'd like to look into this more. I can't imagine there are 2,000 critical controls in a mine unless mines are way more complicated than I've seen in my experience in mines. But I could be wrong. I'm wide open to that. Steel on steel. Argue with me. Tell me I'm stupid. I'm always ready. That is Dr. Jim Joy. Thank you, Sidney Decker, for the cute introduction. Thank you mostly for listening. I'm so glad you're a part of this. Tell your friends and subscribe for sure. Let's get those numbers up there. That'll help a ton. Until then, learn something new every single day. Have fun. And for goodness sakes, be safe. <laughs>